and welcome to Auto Shenanigans. How the devil are you? Have you had a good week? My name is John. Thank you very much for joining me for another exciting Great British Road journey in the pissing down rain. Today we're in Essex again for a journey that will take us from Chelmsford to Colchester. As always, to navigate our way there, we'll be using my 1923 guidebook, period correct maps and my own intuition, if you can call it that. We start then with Chelmsford, the third largest town in Essex, outdone by Colchester, which in turn is outdone by Southend, which we won't be visiting. And interestingly, back in the days of my guidebook, the top three towns in Essex were exactly the same. Chelmsford has many exciting and interesting things to look at, and accordingly we start with tyres. My 1923 Michelin guidebook was really a method to sell your car tyres and as such it lists all of the authorised Michelin tyre dealers and repair shops in each town. One such organisation was known as Eastern Automobiles who had several car showrooms and garages but their headquarters was located here on London Road. They set up shop in 1914 selling standard motor cars and would later go on to expand their offerings with Triumph and Morris vehicles. Today the headquarters building survives and is still used mainly for automotive purposes, selling tyres in fact, but it's been covered up with some horrible grey and doesn't look anything like the original. Another thing that looks nothing like it used to is the Marconi radio factory found on Marconi Road. Today it's mostly a housing development, but there are a few clues remaining as to what used to be situated here. Apparently Chelmsford is the birthplace of radio because in 1899 a chap called Guglielmo Marconi set up the first radio factory in the world, not here but on Hall Street a short distance away. The larger factory here would come a bit later and in 1920 it would become the site of the first radio sound broadcast in the UK. Little remains of the original factory but you can still see it on older satellite images and its water tower still remains along with a building that I think used to be used for administration purposes. It's time to move on and my guidebook suggests we pick up the A12 to head towards Colchester and that does make sense but back then the A12 used to run right through the middle of Chelmsford over Stone Bridge which as you can see has now been pedestrianised making it a trifle difficult to follow the guidebook's route suggestion. No bother though, a little bit of manoeuvring around Chelmsford and we'll soon be on our way. And what we're going to do is not follow the original A12 because it's boring and instead follow its replacement, today known as the A138. This bypass was built to replace the A12 mentioned in my guidebook but since then has also been replaced itself by another A12 so Chelmsford has had three A12s in total. Coming this way on our journey gives me the perfect excuse to stop by the Army and Navy roundabout, named after a pub that's long since been demolished. For years this roundabout has been causing problems with traffic and the most recent A12 bypass was built in an effort to solve that issue. Until its completion though, a temporary solution was installed at the roundabout by way of a single carriageway viaduct or flyover. It was made of tin and silly putty and this temporary structure was installed in 1976, remaining in place up until 2020, at which point it was demolished because it was deemed unsafe. The newer A12 didn't really help matters too much and no replacement flyover was built, with the council still having conversations on how to fix the traffic issues at the Army and Navy roundabout. The same conversations that started in the 1960s. Good work, guys. We'll pick up the old route on the outskirts of Chelmsford at Boreham, but before we do, I wanted to stop in and look at a recently abandoned road. The Boreham Interchange has had a new road and bridge built at great expense because they're building a new railway station and several thousand houses nearby. The now abandoned road used to cross over the railway line on a smaller bridge and offered access to a quarry and school, but today it's a dead end road going nowhere. Just over the road from the Boreham Interchange is Boreham House, a Grade 1 listed mansion that was built in 1728 and today operates as a wedding venue. Between 1931 and 1997 it was owned by Henry Ford, you know, that guy what made the cars. It's said that Mr Ford bought the mansion to improve farming standards and agricultural processes, founding the Henry Ford Institute of Agricultural Engineering on a portion of the site. In the 1950s, the site was transferred over to the Ford Motor Company, who turned it into a college and training centre for Ford tractor operations, with the site falling into private ownership in the late 1990s. Our route takes us through Boreham and Hatfield Peveril? Peveril? I'm Peveril. What does that say? I'm not really sure. Our route takes us through some towns along the B1137 that runs parallel to today's A12. The B1137 is actually a Roman road that used to run from Chelmsford to Colchester, so we're not only following the route of the 1920s, on this occasion we're following the Romans. The road will take us into Witham, but before we get there I'm going to turn off at Hatfield, uh, that bloody town, to take a quick detour. Have you ever heard of the Goat Canyon Trestle Bridge? It's a railway bridge found in California and it's absolutely stunning. And when I learned that England has got its own railway trestle bridge, as you might imagine, I got rather excited. 
which was a waste of time because it's not quite what I had in mind. This is Wickham Bishop's Viaduct, the last surviving trestle railway bridge in England. It sits on the now abandoned Braintree to Malden branch line, which of course was closed in the 1960s by Dr Beeching. The railway was built to the cheapest specification they could get away with. You won't find grand multi-arch brickwork on this railway. Oh no, just a few bits of timber nailed together. Remember, all built to the cheapest specification they could get away with. Frankly, it's a f***ing miracle that this viaduct is still standing, having been built in the 1840s, but it did have a helping hand with some restoration work in the 1990s. There were two of these trestle bridges built on the railway, one being a 500-foot-long double-track viaduct, which would have been moderately exciting to explore, but in the 1860s, only 20 years after its construction, it was converted to a single track line and the viaduct was narrowed. It was then shortened from 500 foot to 150 foot in the 1920s by extending the embankments on the northern side. I'm not really sure why they did this, maybe it was to reduce the bridge maintenance bill. In any case, there's no trace of that bridge left and we're left with a shorter viaduct that before long will most likely rot away, what with it being wood and all. Our journey takes us through with them. Back in the old days, a small town with a population of only around three and a half thousand. But throughout the 1960s and 70s, the town would have several council estates forced upon it by Greater London Council. It was all part of a post-small disagreement rebuild the country plan. Along with entire new towns being created, smaller towns like Witham were extended with a selection of delightful buildings and today Witham is home to over 25,000 people. One of the main employers in the town is Baird's Maltings. The company was founded in Glasgow in 1823. Turns out Scotland was rather fond of a beer or two and as a result demand grew and with that so did Baird's who moved into supplying other breweries with their malt products. In 1925, they purchased the site at Witham, which would see the addition of the more modern-looking setup we see today in the 1960s, which is capable of producing over 48,000 tonnes of brewing malt a year. Now that we're all thoroughly smashed, let's jump in the car and continue our journey, and we're forced onto the modern A12 for a short distance as it was built over the old road. We turn off onto the B1024 that runs through Kelvedon, which used to be the A12, but following the construction of a bypass in the 1960s, it was downgraded and the new bypass became the A12. Having passed through Kelvedon, we rejoin the modern A12, but it isn't long before we make a stop. Right next to the A12, a little way up from Kelvedon, is a racetrack. Now you might notice it's a little bit small, and indeed this racetrack is for radio controlled cars. It opened in 2006 and it's operated by Colchester Model Car Club. Interestingly, next door to the radio control car track are the remains of what I think is an abandoned race or training circuit. However, it wasn't for vehicles, it was for horses. Or at least I think it was. I couldn't find any details to say for sure, but if you take a look at some older satellite images, we can see the route or the course that this circuit used to take, and all along the way are what appear to be some sort of horse jumping fences. Some of those are still in place today, and on closer inspection, they certainly look like horsey things, so I'll say that yes, this is an abandoned horse racing or training circuit. I love horses, best of all the animals. I'm up at junction 25 of the A12, and we need to turn off here because the plan is to head down the B1408. In the old days, and looking at our old maps, this used to be a simple T-junction, but in the 1980s, the A12 was extended and turned into a dual carriageway as part of the Colchester Bypass, leading to a complete rearrangement of the roads at the junction. It's absolutely pissing it down, so I'm going to jump in the car where we're going to follow the B1408, and that should take us right into Colchester, where my guidebook points out the large sections of Roman city wall remain that run alongside Balkan Hill. It's also where we find Balkan Gate, the largest surviving Roman gateway that dates back to the second century. The second? There used to be more of the gateway, but someone sort of built a pub on it. When you visit, you might notice the walls and pub are overshadowed quite literally by a much larger, more modern building. This is Jumbo, the water tower. It's over 130 foot high and its water tank can hold 228,000 gallons of water. As water towers go, it's pretty bloody massive and it was built in 1883. Ah, that explains it, it's Victorian, no wonder it's awesome. At the time, Colchester was lacking a reliable and clean water source, which was leading to all sorts of health concerns and problems. Not only that, people sort of kept setting stuff on fire and it's very hard to extinguish a fire when you've got a limited water supply, so they thought, this and they built the largest water tower that they possibly could. Only one year after its completion, the Great English Earthquake of 1884 would strike the town. No, I hadn't heard of it either, but it turns out it was one of the most destructive earthquakes the UK has ever had, with 1,250 houses being damaged or destroyed in Colchester alone. The chunky water tower, on the other hand, laughed it off and was pretty much undamaged, remaining operational up until 1980. Today, the water tower is under the control of North Essex Heritage, a charity organisation set up in 1995 to preserve and regenerate buildings such as this, and in the case of Jumbo the Water Tower, they offer tours for a small fee. 
Sticking with the water-based theme, I've come to Aberton Reservoir on the south side of Colchester in search of an abandoned road. It might be underwater, but I'm not exactly sure. The road we're looking for is Church Road, which you can see here. The thing is, because it wasn't able to keep up with demand, in 2007 the reservoir was extended and the B1206, or Church Road, was sort of in the way, so it was realigned and the old road was left there and I imagine in time the reservoir will swallow it up completely if it hasn't already. The reservoir was built in the late 1930s, opening in 1939, just in time for the second small disagreement. At the time, the Ministry of Defence were worried that the reservoir could be used by enemy seaplanes to form some sort of invasion and so 300 anchored mines were laid out in a grid formation across the reservoir, although none of them were ever needed. The reservoir also served as a practice area for RAF 617 Squadron, better known as the Dam Busters. They performed their last practice run on May 14, 1943, and only two days later were entering German airspace to carry out their mission. And there we are then guys, that's all we've got time for this week. Thanks very much for watching, I hope you liked the video. If you did, there is of course a button specifically for that, and if you haven't subscribed already, please consider doing so, that'd be wicked sweet awesome. Enjoy the rest of your week, whatever it is you get up to. My name's John, you've been watching Auto Shenanigans, and I'll see you guys next time for another exciting Great British Road Journey. Until then, take care, bye bye.